So the recent talk of the town has been Donald Trump recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. This has led some to believe that God is using Donald Trump to expedite the second coming of Jesus Christ because they believe that Israel plays an important part in end time Bible prophecy. I'm going to be discussing that in this video, but before I do, make sure and subscribe to my channel and click on the bell icon so you don't miss any of my future uploads. So, many Christian churches today believe and teach that the literal nation of Israel is blessed by God and whoever blesses it is blessed in return. This comes from verses such as Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6, which says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And Genesis chapter 12 verse 3, where God told Abraham, the father of the Israelites, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Therefore, President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is looked on favorably by many Christians, especially his evangelical supporters, because they believe that in supporting Israel, the United States will be blessed by God. Boy, are they wrong. I'll be getting more into why shortly, so keep watching. Many Christians have accepted a prophetic interpretation of the end times called Futurism. Futurism teaches that most of the events of the book of Revelation and the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9 are to be fulfilled sometime in the future. The outline of events goes something like this. Jesus will rapture his church. There will be seven years of tribulation, which will give all those left behind a second chance to repent. Many Jewish people will be converted to the faith there will be a third temple built. The Antichrist will enter the temple and proclaim himself to be God. This Antichrist will be a world leader who will receive worship. He will gather the armies of the world to attack Jerusalem and Jesus will intervene to deliver the Israelites and destroy those armies gathered against it. Cool story, bro. It's just not going to happen that way. This is actually a modern interpretation of Bible prophecy that can be traced back to a Jesuit priest from the Roman Catholic Church named Francisco Ribera. During the time of the 16th century Protestant Reformation, the reformers unanimously agreed and condemned the papacy, the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church, as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. For example, John Knox, leader of the Scottish Reformation and founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, wrote, the Pope is the head of the Church of Antichrist. And Thomas Cranmer, leader of the English Reformation and Archbishop of Canterbury, who was burned at the stake by the Queen of England for heresy, stated as his dying testimony, As for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and the Antichrist with all his false doctrines. The Roman Catholic Church, in order to remove the stigma of the Pope of Rome being identified as the Antichrist, commissioned Francisco Ribera at the end of the 16th century to develop an interpretation of end-time prophecy which would shift attention from the Pope. So Francisco Ribera developed Futurism, which taught that the Antichrist would appear in the future just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and that the Antichrist would rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, pretend to be God, and conquer the world among other things. Futurism started gaining acceptance in Protestant circles after Manuel de la Cunza, a Jesuit from Chile, wrote a manuscript in Spanish promoting Futurism entitled The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty, under the pen name of Juan Yosafa Rabbi Ben Ezra around 1791. He wrote under an assumed Jewish name to obscure the fact that he was a Catholic in order to give his book better acceptance in Protestantism. And it worked. In 1827, Edward Irving, a Scottish Presbyterian and forerunner of the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements, translated Lacunza's book into English. Now, the idea of a secret rapture wasn't part of Futurism yet. It was mainly about avoiding identifying the papacy as the Antichrist. But that changed in 1830, when Margaret MacDonald, a 15-year-old Scottish girl and member of Edward Irving's congregation, had visions 
of a secret rapture of believers before the appearance of the Antichrist, and she informed Irving of her visions by letter. Consequently, Irving attended prophecy conferences in Dublin, Ireland in 1830 at Powerscourt Castle, where he promoted both futurism and a secret rapture. One of the attendees of the prophecy conferences, John Nelson Darby, a Church of England clergyman, later with the Plymouth Brethren, visited America several times between 1850 and 1874, where he preached futurism and a secret rapture, and his theology was readily accepted. Darby also wrote about futurism, and one of the people influenced by his writings was Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, the author of the Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield included notes on futurism in his Bible, which was first published in 1909, and by 1930, one million copies were sold. So a lot of Protestants were reading about and accepting futurism and the secret rapture doctrine. But it didn't stop there. Louis Sperry Chafer, a student of Cyrus Schofield, founded the Evangelical Theological College in 1924, now called the Dallas Theological Seminary, which is quite possibly the most influential seminary in the United States. Futurism and the secret rapture is part of the curriculum and it is now evangelical doctrine. And the list goes on. There have been numerous influential people, books, and Protestant schools and ministries that have endorsed futurism and the secret rapture. And this is how it made its way into Protestant churches. If you want to learn more, I'll leave a link in the video description entitled The Catholic Origins of Futurism and Preterism. There isn't going to be any future Antichrist. The Antichrist is alive and well today. And it's not a person, it's actually a system, and that system is the Roman Catholic Papacy. Check out my video entitled 10 Facts About the Antichrist, Is It Donald Trump? for more details. I'll leave a link to it in the card on the upper right hand corner of the screen. Also, the Bible doesn't teach us that a third temple needs to be built. That's a misinterpretation of scripture. And there isn't going to be any secret rapture. Armageddon isn't going to be a war between the nations of the world and Israel either. And I'll get into that in just a minute. You see, the literal nation of Israel is not God's chosen people anymore. The nation of Israel was God's chosen people at one point in time, but when they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, that came to an end. That's because their election was on condition of obedience to God. Deuteronomy chapter 26 verses 17 through 19 says, Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God, and that you will walk in His ways and keep His statutes, His commandments, and His judgments, and that you will obey His voice. Also, today the Lord has proclaimed you to be His special people, just as He promised you that you should keep all His commandments and that He will set you high above all nations which He has made in praise, in name, and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as He has spoken. Jesus confirmed this when speaking to the Jewish religious leaders in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43, saying, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So the status of the nation of Israel as God's chosen people was given to another nation. What nation is that? Is it Poland? Maybe that's why all those pictures of Jesus make him look like a white man. Acts chapter 13 verse 46 gives us an idea. There, Paul and Barnabas was preaching the gospel to the Jews and Gentiles in the city of Antioch. And the Jews rejected their message. It says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. So since the Jews, now I'm not talking about all of the Jews, but the majority of the Jews in Jesus' time rejected the gospel, God's focus turned from the Jews to the Gentile believers and they became God's new chosen nation or people. I'll show you in a minute how this applies not only to the new Gentile believers but Jewish believers as well. Notice how in speaking of the new Gentile believers, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 through 10 now calls them God's chosen people. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How do we know this is talking about the Gentiles? Because of the next verse, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The Gentiles were not considered God's chosen people in the past because God worked through the literal nation of Israel. But since the literal nation of Israel rejected the gospel, the gospel was preached to the Gentiles and those who accepted it now became the people of God. In Romans chapter 11, it uses an olive tree to symbolize Israel and illustrates the Gentiles becoming the people of God by comparing the Gentiles to branches being grafted onto the olive tree. And this leads us to another concept, spiritual Israel. All who believe in God today, that is, the church, is spiritual Israel. This includes all Gentile and Jewish believers alike. To confirm this, Galatians chapter 3 verse 7 says, Know ye therefore that they which are of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham? And verses 28 and 29 say, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All believers, both Jews and Gentiles, are one in Christ and children of Abraham by faith. They are spiritual Israel. The Bible even calls New Testament believers Israel. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9 verse 6, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. That is, God's Israel is not made up only of the literal nation of Israel. Those who are of the faith are counted as the Israel of God. For example, James, when he wrote to the church in James chapter 1 verse 1, he said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Obviously, this isn't in reference to the literal twelve tribes of Israel because during James's time, there were only two tribes in existence, Benjamin and Judah. The other ten tribes had been lost track of after the northern kingdom of Israel was taken into Assyrian captivity in 722 BC and they were gradually assimilated by other peoples. This helps us understand who the Bible is talking about when it mentions Israel in end time Bible prophecy. For example, in Revelation chapter 7, it talks about the 144,000 who come from the 12 tribes of Israel. Many prophecy scholars believe this refers to literal Israelites when, in reality, it's talking about the Christian church. So when the Bible talks about Israel in end time prophecy, it's really talking about the Christian church. And a lot of these prophecies that you hear about the role of the literal nation of Israel in the end times is misapplied or taken out of context. Like there will be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem from which the Antichrist will declare himself to be God, and Armageddon will be when the Antichrist leads the armies of the world to attack Jerusalem. It's not going to happen. The war in the last days is not between the devil and the literal nation of Israel. It's between the devil and the church. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 puts it this way. And the dragon, symbolizing Satan in Revelation chapter 12 verse 9, was wroth with the woman, symbolizing the church in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. A remnant is the last remaining part of something, so this is talking about the church in the end time, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And doesn't that just make sense? Why would end time prophecies revolve around the literal nation of Israel since it has rejected Jesus as the Messiah and is not preaching the truth? No, it revolves around spiritual Israel, the church. That's not to say that God doesn't have a plan for the Jews. I believe that he does. I believe many of them are going to be converted when the gospel is preached to the entire world in preparation for Jesus' second coming. But the Bible talks about two Israels, literal Israel and spiritual Israel. And end time prophecies that deal with Israel now deal with the church because the church is God's chosen people who he uses to preach the gospel. By the way, there's a lot more that can be said about the subject of spiritual Israel. And if you want to learn more, check out the link in the description box entitled Spiritual Israel. 
The whole idea of a future Antichrist, rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, and a secret rapture are modern teachings that can be traced back to the Jesuits of Rome and a 15-year-old girl. And the role that Israel is going to play in the end times is not what many people believe it's going to be. When the Bible talks about Israel in the end times, it's talking about spiritual Israel, that is, God's church. Thank you for watching. Check out my Soldier in the Army of God shirt. I'll leave a link to it in the card on the screen and in the description box. It's available with free shipping in the United States until Christmas. It comes in a variety of styles, sizes, and colors. It could be a good conversation starter to help you share your faith. And proceeds from your purchase help support my channel. If you enjoyed this video and if you feel it has blessed you and helped you understand the Bible better, feel free to like it and share it to share the blessing. And check out some more of my videos by clicking on the screen. I have a lot of good Christian videos, which I'm sure you'll enjoy if you liked this one. God bless you.